Welcome everybody to the Right Place podcast where we learn with you how to navigate the world by building connections that matter, relationships that last, and businesses that thrive. My name is John Watson and today I'm joined by two friends of mine, one you know already. Hey Rudolf, how's it going? Good, thanks John. Awesome. And our new friend, uh, international speaker and author of The First Minute, Chris Fenning. Hello Chris, welcome to the Right Place. Thank you for having me. Hello, John. Hello, Rudolph. Great to chat to you, Chris. How has 2024 started on your side? Good. It's uh, and currently outside my window, it is snowing hard. So uh, we're looking like we might get some tobogganing in in the next few days. Okay, excellent. And and yourself, Rudolph, how are things in Pretoria? It's uh, much warmer. I took a swim yesterday. Went to the cricket as well. Watched some action-packed cricket. Um, yeah, and the, the year started off really well. It's been quite busy. You can't believe it's only middle of the first month of the year already. Um, feels like we've been working straight through, although I took a nice long break and refreshed and energized for the year. Awesome, man. Yeah, it's also nice and sunny and warm here in Cape Town. And yeah, looking forward to um, some, some beautiful weather while, this, while the summer uh, is still around us. Yeah, for sure. And also when, when Chris joins us um, in February, hopefully there's some nice weather at that stage as well. Um, yeah, so, so John and I connected last year, September time with, with you, Chris, and we, we actually asked you what, this would, what it would take to bring you to South Africa. And I read your book and I, I challenged John to that. And, and John actually also um, listened to the book on, on Audible at that stage, which I didn't know. And we actually found it so practical that we we started implementing it as we read. And then when we discussed it, we were like, yeah, we need to bring Chris to South Africa. We've been in corporate business for, for 20 odd years and we've seen all these mistakes already. So it can't just be us. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and luckily you said yes, you said it's a go. Um, and you're combining it a bit with a family holiday, which you're also excited about. Um, yeah. So, so yes, are you, are you excited to come and, and talk to us here in South Africa and explore a bit? I absolutely am. And it's, uh, it's always flattering to be asked. And it was, <laughs> you both took exactly what I'd hoped from the book. And the feedback you just gave about it being practical, there is no higher praise from, from where I'm sitting, because that is... <laughs> my entire approach to business communication to training practical things that are simple frameworks straightforward and that you can use right away so the fact that that's what you took away from it is uh, it's wonderful to hear uh, the bonus is we get to include a family holiday my wife and i both work internationally and we have a sort of family rule slash guideline which is if we can turn a work trip into a family adventure we will we're limited by school vacations. We have a, a young daughter, but yeah. if we can turn a trip into a into a family experience and adventure, we absolutely will. And South Africa was already on our list, so this all worked out very, very well. And it's always exciting to come and talk to new people and make a real difference in their communication. But so, on that, uh, what are you most looking forward to? <laughs> I've got a personal and a professional answer from that. Uh, the personal is the penguins. The idea of seeing penguins in continental Africa blows my mind. It's not <laughs> this, the juxtaposition of uh, penguins live in cold places, don't they? Except they don't. <laughs> so that, that's going to be a real highlight for me. And then professionally, the, I, I love talking about the first minute and training on the first minute. I do that all every week so it's a really big part of my business and it never gets old i absolutely love it and this will be the launch of my newest book and newest program the 39 ways to make training stick and that has been a whirlwind experience over the last six months from idea through publication and training events so that uh, getting that out into the world is very exciting Awesome, Chris. Thanks so much, man. Yeah, we're looking forward to, to seeing the penguins with you when you when you're in Cape Town and also exploring some other places in, in Pretoria. Um, so today we want to learn more about the person, the author, the speaker, um, all in anticipation of your arrival in South Africa. Um, so Chris is an international business communication specialist and has written three books, the multi-award winning The First Minute, 
effective emails, and like you just mentioned, arriving on 31 January, 31st January, 39 ways to make training stick. So Chris, who is Chris Fenning in 2024, and what does this year mean to you personally? Who am I in 2024? Well, the philosophical answer is I'm the culmination of the previous 41 years. Uh, a slightly less cheesy answer is this is a year where I'm I'm getting out into the world more often. I love to write. So I, I would write books all day, every day, and then teach on top. This year, I'm going to flip the script on that and get out and do far more teaching, far more talks. And that's because I get energized when I'm in a room with people or on the screen with people. It actually works well virtually in addition to in person. And seeing people come into a session with a problem and leave a session, not only knowing a solution, but having implemented it, having practiced it and saying, gosh, I could, this will make a real difference. And I'm already using it right now. That is a very energizing experience for me. So to bring that to South Africa and over to the States and a few other, uh, through other places as well, that is what 2024 is for me. A very energizing, get out into the world, spread the word and make a difference. Oh, that sounds amazing. So, I mean, it sounds like you're in your right place. You're in your right place where you can lean into your gift of business communication, lean into the energy that you get from training and, and just make it happen on another level in 2024. Oh, yes. Yeah. And the transition from where I was mm -hmm. four years ago as in full-time employment, I had a, a 20 plus year career ranging from engineering and defense, healthcare, web hosting, travel industry, of quite a, quite a broad range of experience leaving that full-time employed work about four years ago and transitioning into business, the business of communication, I, am, I love what I do. And every day is a joy. There's hard work. There, there are certainly moments that, that are, it's not all sunshine and rainbow, rainbows, but you say I'm, I sort of found my place. Yes, I absolutely have. This is, uh, I suppose this is my calling. This is what I am, uh, everything I've done up until now combines really nicely into teaching training writing and speaking well it's obvious and it's it's quite clear to me that you have this massive passion for communication and and if i might say you do it particularly well um so <laughs> that's lucky <laughs> if the answer was different this would go very different it would be it would be a problem it's um so how how did it come about that you have this Passion, what ignited it? Is there a specific moment that you can remember where it comes from? Or is it just a culmination of, of all the experience that you've built on? Because you, you were in IT and, and more technical, I suppose, and project management and the likes. Um, but transitioning into communication, what sparked that and drove you towards that? Yes, there's, it would be nice to say there was one particular moment that sort of uh, light from the sky came down. I had that aha moment. But as with most of these changes, it was multiple things that come together. Now, uh, throughout my career, as you mentioned, I've been in IT and in engineering, project management, run merger and acquisition programs. And throughout that, a consistent part of, of me was being curious, being practical and talking a lot. And early in my career, talking a lot was a negative because I didn't do it very well. Fortunately, I was given some guidance that turned me from the path of lots of talking equals good communication onto the better path of learning the skills, learning the frameworks and the methods to communicate effectively in different situations. So that stuck with me through my whole career. And then as I became a, a manager and leader and a director uh, in a very large company in the U.S., I took on a role of teaching other people this. So I would teach the people in my teams, the other teams in my department, other departments in the organization. And it ended up with me teaching sort of a 300 person department that I'd never worked with before. They didn't know who I was, but I was brought in because I was known for being a good communicator, good at communicating with customers, with clients and with executives. So all of that was building up my experience, building up the frameworks, me finding my way in the communication field. And then a couple of events all came together. The first was, I think it was on my second or third uh, executive development program, and there were communication training courses in there. And they would say things like, to be a good communicator, you need to be clear and concise. And 
me being the person who asked questions, stuck my hand up in the air and said, great, how? And they couldn't answer how. And there was never a how, which frustrated me. And that's what drove me to write the first minute. It's a literal framework for how to be clear and concise. So that was the first event. The second event was uh, I went through some health issues in the States and I needed to change my career. I was working 60 to 80 hours a week. I had a, a, at the time a one-year-old and my health deteriorated quite significantly. So I had passion. I had a problem I, I could solve in the first minute. I had to make a change in my work lifestyle. And we wanted to move from America back to Europe to be closer to our family. And those things came together and it prompted my wife to say, you need to make a change. Let's work out how you can go and do this business by yourself. And my best friend said, if you don't become a communications instructor, I'm going to come over there and knock you on the head because this is what you're meant to do. And I, I hadn't realized it until that point. So those two things, the support, love, and slight threat of violence from a friend <laughs> put me on this path. And I took the leap. We left America, we came back, and I gave myself a few years to see if I could make this work. And it has gone beyond my wildest dreams. That's amazing, Chris. It's so it's so inspirational to hear a story like that, where we where you're almost stuck in an impossible situation, but yet that difficult situation had prepared you for your next step, where you had taken all the challenges and all the non-communication and all the bad communication you've seen, and now you've turned it upside down and turned it into into a career that that we we think is thriving, and 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 we enjoy reading your books. Um, how did your wife um, handle this? Because obviously you've had your normal day to day and obviously um, you were working very hard, but now transitioning into something where you kind of determine the direction um, that, that you're going in. You kind of the captain of your own ship. You have to figure it out for yourself. How, how did your wife handle that and, and, and what support was she giving you? Uh, she is my, I would not be doing this without her. She is my biggest supporter. And she gave me the most valuable gift possible. There's nothing more valuable uh, in terms of setting up a business. She gave me time and space to do it. So when, when we made this transition, we talked a lot about what it would take. There's the finances of the family. She would become the primary uh, income earner. We were fairly even, but we were, we were dead even before, before this. And with a family and moving to new countries, there's a lot to consider. And we, we looked at it. We looked at it very practically. So she supports my need for spreadsheets, which is brilliant. And she proposed a time frame, having listened to what I thought it would take to run a business. And the answer she gave me blew my mind. And I just can't express my, my love for her and the support. I can't express it enough. She said, well, give it three years. And for anyone starting a business, that's an, that's an incredible time frame. You've, you want to earn enough to keep the lights on. You'll be thinking, well, I've got to make this work in six months. And she said, no, I've listened to what you've said. What do you think the right time frame would be? And I hummed and hawed and sort of dodged the question. She said, okay, three years. If, you're, if this doesn't work in three years, then you've got to get a, got to get a job again. And that time frame was so incredibly valuable because from day one i could make long-term decisions mm -hmm. i didn't have to scramble to try and do something short term i didn't have to rush i could focus on book marketing the first minute it sold over fifty thousand copies it's uh, being translated into 17 different languages i got another language yesterday uh, it's going to be going into indonesian and that could not have happened if I didn't focus purely on marketing the book for about six months, which if you have to keep the lights on and get a business going, that's, that's really hard to do with very long-term thinking. So that gift was phenomenal. It also, at the same time, felt long and short <laughs> because every month that passed, I was thinking, oh no, the time's running out. So I had incentive. I didn't sit back and wait. But that gift of time and the, the complete support that she gave me, it wasn't, I've given you three years, but what, what are your numbers on, on week one? It was mm. a real trust and faith that I would make good decisions. And so that is how, that's how she took it. And I wouldn't be here without her. Amazing. That's, uh, amazing. You, you don't always find that. And um, 
obviously circumstances allowed for it a little bit, but but the sport is is genuine and I'm just happy that it passed the three year because you mentioned that you're already in it for four years. So we stuck with you now. You're not going to call oh, yes. again. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is yeah. it. It um I come. hit the targets within a year and a half. It was wow. uh, and I didn't even then I didn't believe it was real and working. I still had a, a lot of self doubt as I, I know many people who go into business for themselves feel that particularly if you you are the business. I'm not sure. selling widgets. I'm not selling software. I'm essentially selling me and the ideas that come out of out of my head in the form of sure. books and courses and live training events. So sure. that um, th th there's quite a lot of self doubt that can come with that. But having the belief sure. of people around you and Amazon book reviews help us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point. We'll get to that in a bit. Um, so you've, you're from the UK. You worked there. You moved to the US, worked there for a while. You're in France. You're now based in the Netherlands. If you look at communication from all the areas where you've been involved, different industries and different countries, um, are the pain points universal? Are they the same everywhere? Um, or are they different country specific or so on? What's your take on that? It's, it's both. We all suffer the same problems, but in our own particular country's flavor. And that becomes more pronounced when you have people from different, different countries or different socioeconomic areas or different cultures trying to communicate with each other. That becomes even more complex. So... Getting to the point, if you, I, I guarantee, I, I bet every penny I've got that people listening to this can think of a time when they've, when they've experienced this. Someone is talking to them, and one, two, maybe three minutes in, they're thinking to themselves, why are you talking to me? Or oh, I see you both laughing there on the screen. Or they're thinking, what is your point? What are you, why are you telling me this? What do you want from me? Those are universal problems. And the great thing about the areas that, that I focus on is I try and find those problems and then solve them. So the first minute is the answer and the framework so that no one will ever think, why are you talking to me and what's your point? You can avoid those, those problems. Where we get into the international uh, difference, it can be uh, some cultures have a reluctance to say no because they will want to, to very much support their client. Um, some cultures are more direct. Some are more circumspect or will, will talk around a point rather than directly to it. And Erin Mayer wrote a fantastic book on this. Um, it's called The Culture Map. And it's a, it's a global review of how we interact and uh, not just communicate this, others, leadership, um, management stars and things in there as well. And she breaks down with tons of research how different cultures can, can end up sort of at loggerheads and end up fighting each other simply because their cultural background means they are inclined to communicate in one particular way or another. But what is seen as a problem for one is not seen as a problem or an issue for another. So the, I recommend everybody grab a copy of Erin's book the culture map and i think chapter four is about communication if you read just one chapter i'll read chapter one and then read chapter four so read two <laughs> you talk a lot about providing sufficient detail but also providing not over overburdening people with too much detail how do we find that balance between sufficient detail being concise because um the industries that we work with um, it finance there's you need a lot of information to make a certain decision. You almost can't leave anything out. How do we make this balance? Mm. There is, I believe, there is one answer that works in almost every situation for this. Summarize and then ask what else they want to know. If you do that, you avoid the following problems. So I'll say it again. Summarize less than a minute. It possibly even three lines to so summarize and then ask what they need. And here are the problems that avoids. It avoids the problem of the other person already knowing what you're telling them and getting annoyed because you're telling them something they already know. So we want to avoid that problem. It avoids the problem of the other person not caring. 
If you've ever been in a situation where someone is giving you loads of detail and you think, I just don't care about this. I don't need it to make my decision. I don't need it for this other thing. That's frustrating. It damages the reputation. If you deliver and over deliver information to someone, you will damage your communication reputation. And that has knock on effects for client relationships, for career progression, for just generally being invited to things and people rolling their eyes when they say, oh, Chris is going off on one again. Great. Okay, I'll tune out and think about something else. He'll, I'm sure, he'll let me know when he's done. So that the solution is summarized. And the first minute's got one method. There are a couple of other methods, of course, that work, but state use goal problem solution we'll talk about that another time um, and then ask and here's the ask is is there anything else you'd, you you need or want to know about this and if you do that the person can go yes i'm really interested in this detail or please send me everything or no i don't have time i don't care i just want to get to the get to the point or get to the decision so summarize and then ask to compare communication or effective communication to a metaphor or analogy, which I'm sure you use um, less than, than what I sometimes do. Um, what would that be? What would that analogy be? And then how does it influence your approach to teaching and writing? Oh, wow. That is a question I've never been asked before. So if I compared the whole of communication to an analogy, um, I do have one. Yes. It's communication skill. So first of all, I've got to preface it with communication is not a skill. To say that again, communication is not a skill. Communication is a situation where you want to convey message, meaning, information to one or more people. And that situation could be in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. It could be on a stage to a room. It could be in a sales meeting or a conflict. So communication is not a skill. It's a situation. And to communicate effectively, you need to use the right methods, tools, frameworks, and you need to use them well or well enough for that particular situation. So you asked for an analogy or a metaphor, and here it is. Communication is like cooking. To create the outcome you want, a meal, you need to have a range of skills at a good enough level and different ingredients. So you have to have knife skills. You have to be able to use certain types of pans. You also have to know how much of each ingredient to put in and when to blend them. The same is true for communication. If you want a communication outcome, let's say you're negotiating. To get really specific now, you're negotiating a sale. You need to use tools and techniques that are different than if you were de-escalating a conflict in a team. Different skills, very different skills to getting up on stage and presenting because those mm. situations require different ingredients. So communication is like cooking. You pull for, on your different skills and you add different ingredients in different amounts to deliver the outcome you want for that situation. And I can add that you actually bring the, the cookbook and you write it for us. <laughs> I do. I, 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 that is a potential name for a future book, the communication cookbook, where, the where there are recipes for particular situations. What are the skills? What are the skills you really need? You've got fundamental things. And then what are the, the spices and things you could sprinkle on the top if you want to take it to the next level? You can make a, a boring pasta dish with tomato, basil, and, and penne pasta, or you can add in anchovies and capers and white wine vinegar and, and all sorts of other things to spice it up. But you've got to be able to get the basics right first. And rather than going down that, that future book, which doesn't exist yet, the getting the basics right, that's, that's my passion. And that's what in these books and in the trainings, this is what I deliver, is giving people those fundamentals. Think of it as communication cooking 101. These are the skills that when you know how to heat and cut uh, and, and mix the basic ingredients, you will create good meals, even if they're simple. And you can build on that to become a master in whatever particular uh, situations you want to, want to explore going forward. No, Chris, that was an amazing answer. Um, I love the analogy. I love cooking myself. My wife loves cooking. Um, so Africa has got amazing flavors, amazing dishes for you to try when you're out here. So you can look forward to some really, really good food in Cape Town and Pretoria. Yeah. 
we'll show you some nice places. Oh, I'm looking forward um, to that. Yes. Awesome, Chris. Um, so in communication, the pause or the moment of silence can be as powerful as words. So we've talked a lot about words. Let's talk about silence. How do you view the role of silence or taking a pause moment um, in effective communication? And do you incorporate any of this into your, your training that you present? Ooh, a few parts to the question there. So how important is it? It can be very important. It can also be devastating if, if used incorrectly. So the pause is, is what we're talking about. It's another method. So applying that method or ingredient at the right time makes, makes things work. When is it useful? Well, there are a few different uses for it, again, in different situations. So if I'm, if I'm teaching and I make a particular point that I want the audience to, to really think about for a moment, I'll do some things leading up to the point. I will change the way that I speak. I might speak slower or change the tone or volume. And then when I've made that point, that critical point, I'll pause so that the audience recognizes that an important thing has happened and they get that space to process it. And a pause doesn't have to be long because our brains work at about four times the speed of our mouths. We, we think at something like 800 words a minute. We speak at 150 to 200. Oh, we read at 200 and we speak at 100 to 120. Depending how excited we are, we can really talk fast if we want. So a pause provides time for the brain and the brain works quickly. The pause provides emphasis. It provides space for the audience to consider. And then for anyone listening to this who is in sales, the pause allows the other person the time and space to make the decision. When you get in your sales call and you get to that point of making the offer, so we've got, we've got this event coming up. We've got a number of events in Cape Town and Pretoria. Their tickets are available now at the moment. Um, would you like or will you, will you send 10 people to this event? Then shut up, Chris. Don't say another word. <laughs> don't trample on it. Don't give extra information. Don't go because of this and then resell and, and give the person the space. And that is one of the, particularly in sales, a very powerful use of pausing. And it's hard to do. Can you um, remember a specific instance in some of your training sessions where someone had this aha moment and they had a breakthrough? And, and can you mention one that, specifically stands out for you yes yes and it happens regularly this isn't a one person event so part of the one of the first minute training events there are a couple of different types but the in one of them the audience members practice creating a summary of an update they need to give and i do a whole program on this called smart status updates we're going to be delivering that i believe in cape town that's one of the events in cape town it includes and in pretoria includes smart status oh. updates and so the, the, the participants in the training take two minutes to use a framework that they've just learned about to write down a very quick summary. And it's three sentences. And then a few people will stand up and deliver it. And this is, this is the aha moment that I love because it happens every time. Somebody gives the update and another person in the audience, because it's usually team, says, oh, okay, so that's what's happening on that. Great, we don't need the call next week. They actually deliver an entire status update and they start knocking meetings off their calendars because mm. the audience goes, oh, great, that's everything I needed to know. Um, and they might ask a follow-up question or they'll say, oh, great, I'll talk to you for a couple of minutes at the end and, and we can wrap that up. So the room, so those two individuals get that real experience and the whole room gets to see, oh, wow, by giving three lines, we can kill a whole meeting? Or at least you know, maybe cut it down, turn it into a short conversation. And that moment, it gets me every time. And uh, I think I'll be disappointed if it doesn't happen at some point, because it leads on to showing the value of getting the simple things right. And John, coming back to your question earlier of how much detail to give, it shows you don't need to give. You can ignore 90% of what we normally deliver in an update. And we can give a, the right information in the right way. And the audience goes, great, thank you. I've got it. No questions. Let's move on. 
Excellent, Chris. Now, after these training sessions that you do, where people have these breakthroughs, they go back to the organizations, they go back to their teams, and there can be sometimes some resistance to change. Resistance to change, the number of meetings, the detail in emails, things like that. How do you address that? And, and, and do you address it in, um, in your training sessions on the first minute? And, and what strategies have you found effective in getting teams and leadership on board with, with, with what you, you train people on? Well, of, of course, the answer is bring me in to individually train everyone in the company. Because that's clearly the best, best approach. I'm available. Uh, please call. <laughs> and sometimes that is the right answer. I worked with a company in the UK where I, I trained the executive team. And then the outcome of that was they said, OK, you're now going to come and train all our direct reports. And then they said, how do we roll this out on mass across the company in a more accessible, time friendly and lower cost way on a per person basis? So tongue in cheek, bring me in, uh, but it does actually work. More seriously, uh, and more often, there are a couple of things that I do, and this leads very nicely into the 39 ways to make training stick. So one-off training doesn't work. I believe that one-off training doesn't work. And that's because the science behind it is called the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. <laughs> In summary, something like 70 to 90 percent of what we learn, we forget within 24 to 48 hours because sure. we are in, we go back to our jobs, old habits creep in and and just naturally we're not good at learning something once and applying it always. Plus, as you mentioned, resistance to change, the team is still using the old methods, other people aren't, haven't had the training and so on. So those are the reasons that it's very difficult to have one-off training that succeeds. So some of the things that I do in my own workshops are at the end or towards the end of the session, everybody identifies two actions, very specific actions they're going to take, and then they enter them in a form and they get some reminder emails over the next few days to remind them to do the things that they said they would do. And mm -hmm. while there's a little bit of oh, oh, another email, it does help properly. Another method is they pick someone they're going to train one item from the workshop. They don't have to train the whole thing. They're not running a 90-minute workshop, but one important takeaway. And every attendee says, okay, I'm going to pick somebody, and this is who it is, and I write it down, and this is what I'm going to have a 15-minute conversation with them about and help them get the benefit from it. So that spreads the word, reinforces, because when you train someone else, it it's reinforces for yourself. And those are just two examples of some of the things I do. Another... Just to wrap it up with a third one is I will do follow up sessions sort of four, eight and 12 weeks after the main training to do a top up training. And more importantly, to allow people to ask questions about where they've had problems using it or the method doesn't work in their particular team or situation. So they use real examples and we say, all right, maybe the method needs tweaking. Maybe the situation can be approached from a different different angle. So those in in person or virtual follow ups reinforce that training. And those are three examples from the 39 ways to make training stick. There are, of course, 36 other ways in that, in that book that we can use to support trainees after they leave the room. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that session specifically because of the training part. I've always believed that you don't really understand a topic until you teach it to someone. And then you start finding out that there are some gaps in what you th thought you know. Or you're actually good at this and other people can relate to it and understand it, but you don't really know until you've tried to teach it to someone else. Yeah, so we, we're having the first minute tour that we mentioned quite a few times now, starting from the 12th of February. Um, mind you, it's my birthday on the day. I mention it to everyone if I see the date. Um, but from that, from that date onwards is the, is the tour for two weeks. So, John, you've been arranging quite a number of events in the Cape Town area. So what are, we, what are we looking at in Cape Town for the tour, the workshops and so on? So on the 12th, we are hoping to book some one-on-one -on -one, uh, private talks um, at some corporate uh, companies here in Cape Town for, for Chris to talk uh, to, to teams. Um, and what we learned from Chris is that he talks best to finance and IT teams, but he can almost talk to any team. So you don't have to necessarily be in finance or IT or an executive. You can be a junior staff, anyone that's, that's communicating on a daily basis 
or using emails or having to give status updates or, or benefit from him. So on the 12th, you're hoping to, to book some one or two private uh, company talks for him. Then on the 13th of February, we have the first minute small business workshop, which will be at the, the Sun Lamb Auditorium, which will be a full workshop on uh, the first minute with, with a bit of a focus on, on small businesses as well. Then on Valentine's Day, the 14th, Chris is presenting at Innovation City in the heart of Cape Town, uh, which we're very excited about. It's a great, great venue there. And then on Thursday the 15th, we have the 39 Ways to Make Training Stick workshop um, at the Salem Auditorium again. Plus, in the evening, Chris will be talking at the, the Clara Business Network event um, that I run here in Durbanville, Cape Town, which is quite exciting. And then on the Friday, we have an invite-only IT-focused networking event where Chris will be talking about translating tech talk into business language. Um, I think it's going to be a great week. Hopefully, the weather plays plays along and, and your wife and daughter will have a great week um, in Cape Town as well with us. Um, Rudolf, how does your, the week look in Pretoria? Yeah, so we first plan to give Chris a bit of a break since his family is around and needs to see a little bit of the country as well. So that weekend, um, um, yeah, is for Chris to enjoy. Then from the Monday, again, we, we're having some private workshops. Um, we've got three slots available still on the Monday um, for someone to book. The very exciting part for me is the two workshops on the 20th of uh, February. We've got the 39 ways to make training stick. Um, tickets online available at Seat Me. It's at the Atterbury Theatre in Pretoria. Um, starts at half past eight. And the following day on the 21st of uh, February, we have the small, uh, the first minute, also the small business workshop starting again at half past eight at the Atterbury Theatre. Tickets also available online. Then on the Thursday, the 22nd, we've got a planned business uh, networking breakfast in the morning. And then the evening, we have the Irene Business Network, um, the also host in, in Centurion in Pretoria. Um, and then we have one slot open for a private booking or private company talk in the middle of the day. And then lastly, on Friday, before we send Chris back home, um, we'll, we'll have a, bit, a session or two again. Um, we've got a lot of prospects um, lined up for specific ones and, and guys that need to make a decision or two. But if you need to do um, one of these sessions in private and you don't want to attend the, the net or the, the physical events, the, the uh, one of paid events, then you can book your whole team for a, for a workshop rather and get everyone on the same level, which I think presents great value. Um, yeah, so that's what we've planned so far. And then um, a surprise for Chris as well before he goes back home. I do have to show him a little bit of the Pretoria or Gauteng scenery as well and not just leave him at his own Demise, <laughs> or devices, <laughs> rather. Just give me a bus ticket and, and send me out. <laughs> you, you'd be surprised at our public transport here in Gauteng. So. Uh, excellent, Google. Yeah, this, this tour is jam-packed. There's, there's many different events, um, many different angles that Chris is going to be talking on. I think there's something for everyone from the first minute to 39 ways to make training stick to the tech talks, which is a bit more IT-focused. And I really think people can, uh, will, will benefit from this. I think it is very, very practical. And I think it's a good way to start the year. You need to have better communication. Who knows where your company, your business, your products, your services, your solutions can go if you just communicate um, about them better. Um, so what do you think, Chris? Are you excited for the tour? No, I really am. As you were going through the events, I was thinking, oh, we didn't talk about the, the tech to business talk. That is uh, bridging that divide. Yeah, that is going to be a fantastic event. So yes, I'm excited. The the venues are incredible. The Atterbury Theatre uh, looks fantastic, and the uh, the sessions are going to be fully interactive. So if anyone thinks, oh, I've got to listen to somebody talk for 45 minutes or an hour, and then I get a chance for questions, nope, nobody wants that. I don't want that. You don't want that. That's not how we get value. These sessions are interactive all the way through. There'll be activities questions you'll be doing some stuff because applying is a great way to learn and uh, very excited about all the events so yes listening to that was uh getting me even more excited about coming to south africa that's good chris uh, every time that we speak i actually learn something new so even today as we 
we spoke, I got some new pointers and new things. And, and I, I understand the book's got so much information. But, but every time that we engage in thinking about how we communicate, how we handle certain situations in a, in a business environment or giving status updates and so on, you learn something again. So yeah, we appreciate your time. I think the, um, the guys attending the workshops, um, as well as the, the closed sessions for, for corporates are going to get immense value. Um, that, that I don't think is necessarily available in, in the shape, same way, shape and form as, as you're going to present it to us. So I'm really, for one, looking forward to that. Um, yeah, so that's it for today. I think we've taken some, a lot of your time already, but we, I want to thank you, John, for, for putting this together. And Chris, thanks for your time. Thanks for being so willing always to chat to us, but also to for your enthusiasm to come to South Africa and, and make a bit of a difference here. Um, we look forward to that. And, and I quite enjoyed this talk this morning as well. And from me, that's it. Um, we'll see you again next time from Chris as well and John at the right place.